Night, but let's come back to Daniel this evening, our study on through the book of Daniel. And Daniel chapter 3, we are still in this evening. Daniel chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 3, of course, we're looking at these three faithful young men of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Jewish name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Babylonian names that they were given to recognize that they had been taken into captivity. Um, they were being named, names that reflected the gods of the land of Babylon, the false gods, of course, of the land of Babylon. Not even false gods in one sense, because there is no other god but God. But you understand what I mean by context. And we've been looking for the last few weeks at the establishment of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the state religion that he was imposing by force, the consequences of not complying with that state religion to make it better for everyone, uh, bringing all the leaders in, having a little bit of a party, putting on some music, making it nice and comfortable for everyone to bow down except for these three faithful men who, regardless of the consequences, refused to bow because in Exodus 20, the Lord our God told his people that they would have no other gods except him. They wouldn't make it any graven images and that they would not bow down or worship anything other than the true God, the Lord of creation and the universe, Jehovah God himself. So we find that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had been made aware of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's stance. They would have stood out like sore thumbs. And we finished out last week on verse 13 when Nebuchadnezzar was advised that it was an affront to him. It was a, uh, a, a, a direct disobedience to his power, to his laws, probably to his generosity and his graciousness. His pride sent him into a rage, and you'll remember, in his rage and fury, verse 13 said commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. So let's see what happens tonight as we look down from verses 14 to 18 to see what happens as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are before King Nebuchadnezzar. What happens? How does it go? How do they stand? How do they fare? And for a number of weeks, three or four at least, we were looking at the title of Bow or burn? Tonight, verses 14 to 18, we look at the fact that these three young men say they would burn rather than bow. So Daniel chapter 3, verse 14, we'll commence from the word of God. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, or Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to de deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And we'll end our reading there this evening, and may God be pleased to bless the very reading of his word. So we find that the three men are now before the king, the king who had been full of rage and fury, has managed to get a hold of himself. And we find that uh, these three young men, if you will, are now on trial before the king, the lawmaker, the absolute ruler, the despot, the Babylonian emperor, if you will, for their life. They're on trial for their life. God's people. Before the fire, you know, the Apostle Peter speaks very much about the fiery trials that the Christian must go through. But these three young men were in a real trial of fire. And let's uh, see how they fare tonight, see what the Lord will show us from his word, what he may do to strengthen us 
encourage us. Let's bow our heads and pray before we come to God's word. Father, we do thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Father, that you change not and you call us to be steadfast, to stand fast, to quit like men, to be strong. Father, your word tells us you are our high tower, our shield, our buckler. Jesus Christ is our rock. And Father, the imageries of not changing, not bowing, not bending, not compromising on any of the biblical truths which underpin our biblical convictions. Our Lord, on matters of preference, you give us liberty, you give us choice. But on matters of precept, on matters of biblical principle, Father, you call us to stand fast. Regardless of the consequences, regardless of the circumstances. And our Father, I pray tonight you'd help us to see some lessons in truth for our lives that we'd be encouraged and strengthened by the testimony and truth of these three young men, Lord, as they stand before the worldly king, the challenger, Lord, as he challenged you. Father, let's see how that fares and we pray you'd help us with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we could probably all say that really, especially of those who've got a few miles on the clock, so to speak, that sometimes as a child or even when we were immature adults, we all remember being involved with uh, actions or activities for which we didn't appreciate the consequences or for which we just didn't care about the consequences. We knew what they could be, and we just didn't care anyway in our naivety, immaturity, stupidity. You pick whichever one of those you want. But we didn't care. The only time we cared about it is when we got caught out, and it was time to face the music. That's how the saying goes, isn't it? It's time to face the music. Well, it's interesting that music was involved with this, and you could say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were now being called to face the music, the consequences of the decisions that they made. But really, when we talk about the, 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 uh, the situations, the events that we did in naivety, immaturity and stupidity, now we're dealing with a wholly different situation here with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. There was no naivety. There was no immaturity. There was no stupidity. There is only solidity here before them. It's an entirely different situation. They made a conscious decision. To stand fast. They made a conscious decision to stand firm. They made a conscious decision to stand forth in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation in this present evil world. They made a conscious decision, fully aware of the circumstances, fully aware of the consequences, fully aware of their convictions that they had because of God and his word and his truth. They made a decision to faithfully do the right thing for God, no matter what others thought, no matter what the new law of the land was, that didn't matter because it went against God's word. No matter that it went against the brand new state imposed religion, no matter that they were completely aware of both the personal and individual and collective consequences upon the three of them as a group of doing so, no matter that it made the king himself hotter than his furnace in his rage and his fury, they stood and they knew and they made a conscious decision. Where did that start? Did that start here on this day? Did that start when all the governors and the princes and the judges and the captains were brought forth? Did this conviction start on the day that Nebuchadnezzar set up his image? Did this conviction start on the day when they were given the instruction of the new religion, the new laws of the land, the day the music would be played? Did, did that conviction, did they very horridly come to that then? No. Where did it start? This started way back. When they were young men, some something, you know, some twenty odd years possibly before that. This started along with Daniel when he purposed in his heart, Daniel chapter one and verse eight, 
that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And we see the same for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we're very familiar with that from when we went on. But they made a decision before time. They made a decision to follow the Lord. They made a decision, they purposed in their heart. And friends, we've said this before, and I'll say it again. It is so important to get biblical convictions to make your decisions and vows ahead of time. Because if you haven't done that, when the circumstances overtake you, and what we're dealing with here, serious circumstances, life-threatening circumstances, governmental circumstances, law of the land circumstances where it crossed with the law of the word of God. And we need to make those decisions before time to develop our biblical convictions that we're not caught out at the moments of the worst circumstance and maybe the worst weakness as the flesh may fade, that the spirit is willing and strong and stays that way because of the convictions that we get from the word of God before time. We said it before and we'll say it again because it's worth saying. If you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. If you're a Christian with no biblical convictions, then I guarantee I can tell you where you'll end up. You're, you're in a boat floating down the stream that is the cesspool river of this world. And if you're not continually paddling against the flow of this world, you will be washed downstream with all your godless friends, with all your god ungodly influences, with all the ungodly pressure that's put upon you, young or old alike, if you do not make convictions ahead of time and you do not stand in those convictions and you do not purpose in your heart, then if you put yourself in the same shoes as Shagrat, Meshach and Abednego, then you'd be on your face before the golden image, breaking the word of God, but living up to the law of a godless king who is a type of antichrist. It's so important, so important to get some biblical convictions. So how does it stand here? Let's look at verse 14. Firstly, where we see the allegation. The allegation is put. And uh, in the allegation, we find that the option, the option is given to them, uh, again, presented to them, the option about whether it was true or not. Look at Nebuchadnezzar, verse 14. Spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Now, clearly, he has come down from his rage. You know, he, he had a flashpoint temper, rage and fury. I mean, he was a, a, an angry man who went off like a rocket, no doubt about that. But to give him his credit, he needn't have investigated. He needn't have asked them even if it was true. He was a, an absolute ruler. He could have quite easily have just taken the three of them, thrown them straight in the fire, not even giving them an option, not even giving them an opportunity to find out whether it was true or not. And you can picture in some ways Nebuchadnezzar asking, is it true? Not just in an investigative sense, trying to find out the facts. Now, now that is important, by the way. That is important. And particularly if you're of a, a hot disposition, like Nebuchadnezzar, and you get into a rage and a fury, you want to make sure you've got the facts first. Okay, you may not be able to stop yourself getting a little bit mad, a little bit hot under the collar, a little bit angry. Uh, be angry and sin not. Yes, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. But always get the facts. At least if you're going to get hot and bothered, make sure you're getting hot and bothered over the facts. Uh, and time will always give you the facts. Okay, and if you haven't got the facts, then just wait on the Lord. He said, but there's a battle to be fought raging in my life. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. God reveals things in his due time. But Nebuchadnezzar, you could say, is taking an investigatory route. Is it true? But I also think we could look at this question where he's asking them if it's true. is because there's a part of him that thinks it's impossible to be believable. I mean, on any level, you could understand why Nebuchadnezzar is asking, is it true? You know, from the one sense, you could be saying, is it true? Because I'm the king. I've made the law of the land. I'm all powerful. You know I have the power to kill you. You know the allegation that these, uh, these uh, uh, envious Chaldeans who don't like you have made, and I, I recognize that they stand against you. 
So in that sense, is it true? Because don't forget again in Daniel chapter 1, don't worry about turning there. Remember, these, as for these four children, Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 17, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding, all vision and dreams, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And it goes on in verse 20 to say that the king found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So you can imagine the king. He knows Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or he thinks he does. He knows them. He, he, he'd be thinking, I provided for you. I put you through my Babylonian university. It never cost you a penny. I mean, granted, he took them from their homeland, took them captive as prisoners, but in his mind, he was doing a good thing. You know, he was taking these poor pagan uh, Israelite peasants worshipping some kind of uh, 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 semi-demiurge out there in the land of Israel. And he was bringing them to the big city. He was bringing them from ignorance to light to knowledge. He was putting them in a city with the hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the world. He fed them at the king's table. I fed you with my food. I put you through university. I encouraged you. I promoted you. I lifted you. I made you princes in the land. I know you're ten times better than everybody else. We had a pretty good relationship, really, didn't we? Is it true? So you can understand from Nebuchadnezzar's viewpoint in, in two ways. Yes, he's asking, is it true? in an investigatory sense, but is also asking, is it true? Because it seems impossible to be believable that in just this one tiny little thing, I mean, I'm not asking much, music plays, just get on your knees. I mean, don't even worry if it doesn't, you can still worship your God, right? You can still go on and do good things for your God. It's just a little compromise. Nobody's saying it's better than your God, worse than your God. You can't keep your own religion. So long as you join in with the world's religion as well, can it be true that you, that you are willing to die for your God? Can it be true that you would stand against me and all that I have done for you? You know, Nebuchadnezzar's fairness overcame his fury, but he still had an impossibility of the believability of the fact that these three young men would take a stand over something that in his mind is so trivial. Do you know what? Isn't that something we face as Bible-believing Christians? I mean Bible-believing Christians with convictions, by the way. I don't mean you just believe the Bible. I mean you believe and apply the Bible to your life. You stay long enough as a Bible-believing Christian and you will find very, very quickly people will just say, is it true you just won't compromise on this? I mean, for the sake of unity, for the sake of harmony, for the sake of peace in the land, for the sake of your own well-being, surely you could just let this little thing go, right? Isn't that how it goes? You say, Pastor, that's never happened to me. Well, only one of two things. You're either not a Bible-believing Christian or you haven't been around long enough yet because it is going to happen. So the allegation is put and under that. Nebuchadnezzar gives them the option. Then he gives them the question at the end of verse 14. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods? Note the small g there. The gods who are no gods at all. Do not ye serve my gods? nor worship the golden image which I have set up. And again, we said before when we spoke about this image, which isn't totally described, yes, we linked it to chapter 2 and linked it to the image of the head of gold that was Nebuchadnezzar, but I think that's another proof there why this image isn't set in the, the pattern of one of the Babylonian gods, one of the many, 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 the plethora of Babylonian gods, because he says, is it true that do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. So it clearly seems to show that the golden image 
was something different other than the normal run of the plethora of Babylonian gods. So it does seem to indicate what we thought before, whereby Nebuchadnezzar decided it wasn't going to be the whole, just the head of gold, he was going to be the whole body of gold, and Babylon was going to be the body of gold, and it seems to indicate uh, that. So do not ye, you three, my gods, they're very important to me, they're very important to the people of this land. Why have you got to make a stand over your one God? Just add him to all of our gods. My image is just a golden statue. Doesn't mean anything. It's not really serious. Do not you serve my gods nor worship. See, there's the key, isn't it? That was the issue for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nor worship the golden image which I have set up. It wasn't a civic ceremony. This was a new state religion. A new version of worship, and worship was the problem. Isn't that the problem that you and I have as Christians today? That we just won't bow down and worship the gods, small g, of this world. The gods of tolerance, equality, unity, diversity. The gods of uh, capitalistic enterprise. The gods of education, academic achievement, career progression. Those things aren't bad and of the self. Let me say that. I've said it so many, many times before. You get the best education you can. You work the hardest you can. You'll be the best for the Lord that you can. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. God has given us all, you know, one body, many, many, several abilities. And that can be of service, of gifting, of intellect. Use what God has given you to be the best you can be for Christ, but without compromising and bowing down to the gods of this world. Do you see the difference? There's a huge difference. You know, so many people try and make the claim that... uh, that you know, Bible-believing Christians are, 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 are ignorant, are, are, are anti-achievement, anti-progression, anti-education. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Are there some Bible-believing Christians that are all of those things? I'm sure there are, but that's not a charge that levels across at all. Do what you do for the Lord, but have your biblical convictions in place no matter what. So the allegation is made by Nebuchadnezzar in verse 14. The option is given. The question is raised. And now we see in verse 15, the alternatives presented again. Look at verse 15. Now, if ye be ready, here he goes again. He couldn't, actually, you can't fault Nebuchadnezzar, can you really? I mean, for an absolute autocratic despot, an emperor and conqueror of kingdoms, He truly must have had something in his heart for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He truly must have because he had no reason whatsoever. There there could be no self-interest whatsoever in giving a second chance. And in fact, if anything, it would be to his detriment. Because you can imagine all those accusers that brought all the detail and the information to Nebuchadnezzar. What's he playing at? He knows they're guilty. He he saw the three of them standing up like sore thumbs and we came and challenged him into the fire with them. So you can imagine that really for a man in Nebuchadnezzar's position, actually he was extending quite a hospitable position, a patient position. Now, if you be ready, okay, guys, I was mad. Something clearly hasn't filtered through to you. I'm not sure what it is, but let's, Water under the bridge. Let's just forget all that for a moment. Water under the bridge. And let us try again, if you're ready now. Now, if ye be ready, let me just say this again for clarity, boys. At what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. And this is a great day, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I've gone to no expense to put this party on. Don't be a party poopers. Come on now, boys. You've made your point. You've taken your stand. We get it. Jehovah, right? You know, he's, you think he's top God. You think he's, you know, we, we get it. We get it. But for the sake of the spirit of the unity and the occasion, don't ruin it. 
Don't be one of those Bible-believing Christians, you know, one of those Bible thumpers. Never give in any little bit here and never give in any little bit there. Come on, get the spirit of things. I've thrown apart. There's some good music going on. Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. All will be good. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So what do we see in the alternatives? Firstly, we see the corruption restated. If ye be ready. Are you now ready to corrupt yourselves, boys? Are you now ready to compromise? Are you now ready to get rid of those convictions that are holding you back in this world? They're going to ruin not only the career you've got. They're going to ruin not only the position you've got. They're going to ruin not only the possessions you've got, but you won't actually need any of them because your life is going to come to an abrupt end. Are you ready? Are you ready to back down? I wonder what's it going to take. What will it take for us as Christians? I mean, I'm not even thinking as a church now, as individuals. What, what, what will it take for each one of us? Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever stopped to think, what, what, what will it take before I break? You know, I, I worked in the prison service 20 years, as you know, locking up criminals 20 years and, and all the rest of it. And, and you'd get on quite well with the folks inside most of the time. It's just an alternative society anyway. But sometimes, even before I was saved, I used to, you know, I'd look at some of the things these guys were locked up for, you know, serving another sentence for shoplifting, for stealing a 20-pound joint of lamb and a block of cheese, and, you know, doing a 12-month sentence or a two-year sentence because this is his 95th sentence for shoplifting. And I was thinking, you know, you're willing to come to prison for 25 quid's worth of goods. But sometimes then, of course, you'd have people who were coming in and passing the way through. You know, they were in for multi-billion drug pound business, frauds, deceptions, all the rest of it. And, and you'd start to think sometimes, I wonder, you know, I'm sitting here in a uniform. I'm trying to be basically honest. What price? What price would tip me over? To crime, you know, would I, if I thought I could get away with it, and you think of it in terms of prisoner, you know, if a prisoner offered me money for my keys, what price would I give them away? And think, would I do it for 200,000? No. Would I do it for 300? No, no. And you go up and you'd work your way. At what price? And you you think, well, I think I'm good and I'm honest and honest. And you go, what about a million in the Cayman Islands? What about two million? Because the guy who's offering it you has got 50 billion at stake or 40 million at stake. And you wonder, used to wonder, did you have a price there but for the grace of God go on, right? Now the question is, what is it? What is it that will make us be like a Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Or what is it that will cause us to bow down? Do you ever think about those things? Maybe it's just me. Maybe I just have these little back and forths, I don't know. But that's what you have to have, some biblical convictions. I mean, you don't have to overburden your brain. You don't have to worry these things through. But think through some realistic circumstances. You know, when, when I get to college, when I get to university, you know, I, I've been grabbing at church. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't swear. I don't watch all the filthy moves. Don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. But of course, when I get to university, I haven't got mom, I haven't got my church. When I get to college, you know, nobody knows what I'm doing. Nobody knows what's going on. For the sake of fitting in, will I just blend? Will I just start going down with the crowd and say, well, I'll do this and I'll do that, but I won't do this and I won't do that. Think these things through. You know, in the workplace, will, will I do this? Will I turn a blind eye to that? Will I, will I, when I apply for a job, will I make a point on the application? You know, I'm a Christian, don't want to work Sunday mornings, that kind of thing. You know, you think about these things. Those, those things are very difficult in this day and age. I'm not saying there's, there's rights and wrongs for anybody. I'm saying think about these things ahead of time so they don't come up on you unawares. Now, if ye be ready, Nebuchadnezzar said, the corruption was restated. Now, if you are ready to corrupt yourselves. The compromise is re-offered. Ye fall down. You fall down and worship the image. Well, it'll all be good. This little interlude, this will all be forgotten about. Things will go on. Things will continue to be well for you in this world. We'll forget this ever happened. I mean, you'll still be governors. You'll still have a good position. You'll still have money. You can still go away and worship your God, Jehovah. No, but nobody's stopping you. But it'll just be well for you three 
with me, Nebuchadnezzar said. It'll be well for you three with the kingdom. You'll keep your life. It's just a small thing. Do you know this? Even, even godless religion, even the godless religion of Babylon was a second chance religion. Especially for people of power and prominence. And what you find very much is with the world religions, even the most fundamental of them. If somebody has enough power and enough influence and there's something to gain, then rather than throw you to the flames or cut your head off or all these other things that they get to doing and chopping hands off and all the rest of it, you get a sneaky second chance because you've got some influence for the world religion. It's a sad, sad thing. You know, and very much you will find, and even in the history of Christianity, you will find that things have been corrupted to give people additional opportunities because they are people of prominence. The corruption was restated. The compromise was re-offered. The challenge was revealed. Look again at the end of verse 15. You know, he's told them, if you worship not, you'll be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace in the same hour. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Who do you think can help you? Now, really, what is Nebuchadnezzar actually saying? Do you know what he's he's admitting right there? Well, I know we've got the superstition of our religion. And we've got a panoply of gods that we talk about, the harvest, the fish, everything else. But the reality of it is, boys, there's no such thing as God. I mean, religion is just the opium of the masses, right? It keeps the people down, gives them something to do in their spare time. You know, you've got to remember when you're over a kingdom, it's full of ignorant peasants. And so we just give them lots of different gods and superstitions, you know, so they can bow down, do the Hail Mary's holy water and all the rest of it, cartwheels after confession. And if we just keep enough superstition out there, then it's all good, things run smoothly. But if you three are foolish enough to think there's actually a real God, and the real God is your God, and your God can overwhelm me, King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, who's about to have you thrown into the fire, then you're more foolish than I thought you were. I thought you were intelligent, young man. Who is that God? Now, would you note something here at the end of verse 15 when he says, and who is that God? Would you notice the capital G? See, the capital G represents God, the Lord, Jehovah, the God of the Israelites, the God of heaven, the God of creation, the only true God. And we've got such a wonderful Bible that it mattered not that Nebuchadnezzar wasn't referring to him with a capital G because he was referring to the true God. God in his inspired word has put a capital G in there to know that Nebuchadnezzar is asking the question, who is that God that shall deliver you? He's about to find out who that God is that should deliver them. Interestingly, go to Daniel chapter 6. I know we haven't got there yet, but the same thing happens when it comes to uh, the same bunch of deceivers challenging Daniel and his God. Uh, it's Daniel in the lion's den, of course, but we haven't got there yet. But in Daniel ch- chapter 6 and verse 7, when, uh, you know, everybody's going to be coming before Darius, you know, we switched to the Persian Empire by then and, and the Medes, and, and they're trying to still do away with Daniel. Isn't it interesting? All down the line, all those years passed, but God's man is still got the target painted on his back. You're always going to find that. You stand for the Lord and stay standing for the Lord and you stand and don't compromise, you will always find there's a target on your back. It's just that simple. Look at Daniel 6 and verse 7. All the presidents of the kingdom, okay, so these godless power brokers, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, you know, the same band here at Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They might be different men, but they're still the same people. It makes no difference. Have consulted together to establish a royal statute And to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any, what comes next? God? Is that a capital G or a small G? (coughs) 
So they're referring to a multiplicity of gods, but they're specifically going after Daniel, and they're particularly referring to Daniel's God with no reference whatsoever, but the Word of God tells us that they're referring to God, capital G, the Lord, the Creator of heaven and earth. Shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, and, and we know the story, and if you don't, we'll be getting there eventually. But we find the same thing. So even when godless heathens and pagans are making a direct reference indirectly to the true God, our word of God shows us who God is. He's not one among many. He's not one among equals. He's not even a supremacy of a God over other gods. He is the only true and living God. Who is that God? This is, a tra- this, is now, this is not a challenge to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is Nebuchadnezzar now challenging God himself. This is him irreverently blaspheming the true God. And we find this challenge is revealed. But do you know what else we see in, in, uh, in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 15? I said there's much in Daniel that's by type, that's by picture, of course, of Antichrist in the future yet to come. Many things pictured for the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble that is yet to come. And uh, we find that if you go to Revelation 13, 15, we've, uh, we've touched on this parallel a couple of times before, but just to, just to remind you, we're going to find the same situation repeated for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. In Revelation 13, um, we'll just go straight to uh, verse 15. It's relating to the beast. Well, let's read 14. Revelation 13, 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Verse 15. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Do you see the parallel? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before Nebuchadnezzar, a type of antichrist in the mysterious religion of Babylon, in the commercial kingdom of Babylon, won't bow down and are threatened to be killed. So too the same it is for the Jews in the tribulation. If they will not bow down and worship the image of the beast, they will be killed. Well, it will be to anybody. But we find what goes on in, uh, in Revelation 20 and verse 4. We find this great truth uh, unveiled for us. Revelation 20 and verse 4, of course. Now, this is the Lord returning. This is the, uh, the angel coming down to bind Satan in the bottomless pit at the start of the thousand-year millennial reign, the physical kingdom of Christ, when Christ the King returns physically to the earth. But look at Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. See, isn't that amazing? We, we come back in Revelation 19 with the Lord because we've already been raptured in in heaven. But when we come back, so too... Is there a reference particularly to the tribulation saints, to the Jews who would not bow down and worship the image? But see, notice the difference, of course. It's, it's not speaking to Christians, those that, you know, will there be Christians and have there been Christians that have been beheaded for Christ? Yes. But this isn't referring to Christians in the body of Christ. This is referring to those tribulation saints uh, during the time of Jacob's trouble because they've been beheaded for what? Not worshipping the beast not worshipping his image, neither having received his mark upon their foreheads and in his hands. Uh, What was that? That's the patience of the saints. That's a work, okay? Now, we're saved by grace through faith and nothing can change that. But these are a particular people at a particular time who are being honoured because they refuse to do something. And let me ask you something. If you think that's you, isn't our Bible then messed up? 
Because my Bible says I'm sealed and saved till the day of redemption, but this passage says I'm not safe if I don't refuse to take the mark of the beast, if I don't refuse to worship the image. So, so I'm saved by grace through faith until it changes, and then I'm only saved by doing something as well as having my faith. Do you see the difference? That's what's the difference in the tribulation. That's the Jews in the tribulation. Huge difference. Then they're going to have to put some work to the faith that they have. You and I don't. We do works because of our faith. It's a, it's a huge difference. But if you can lose your salvation, which you clearly can, if you took the mark of the beast and bowed down before the image, uh, now you can allegorize that and you can say, well, you know, God to give you the faith not to do it. How do you know? You don't know what you'd do or what you wouldn't do. You've never been in such a situation. All I know is this. The Bible is really clear in Revelation 20. There's some people who had to do something different to you and I. It was a different period of time and it was a different people. I'm saved by grace and sealed until the day of my redemption, regardless of what I do or don't do. And you want to be thankful for that. Now, I know plenty of people, plenty of Christians who are lost in sin and wickedness, gone backwards and backslidden. They're going to be really glad of that because it's got nothing to do with what they do or didn't do. It's all to do with what Christ you know, some serious differences. And we find those things again here. What's going on with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this picture of it? It's all based around what they're doing and not doing. They're exercising their faith, but if they'd have bowed down, they could have lived. Praise the Lord for that. Challenge revealed. And thirdly, we see now in verses 16 to 18, we've seen the allegation, we've seen the alternatives. Now we look at the answer. Now it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's opportunity to speak. Now, we could have stayed in these verses for weeks and weeks and weeks and done numerous Bible studies and preached on it for weeks and weeks and weeks. There are literally hundreds of thousands of sermons and Bible studies on this very short passage of Scripture. It is packed with power. It's packed with illustration, practical truth, and doctrinal wonders. But it, when I look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's answer in verses 16 to 18, I just consider this as a picture of an incredible Christian testimony. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't Christians, all right? But this is a picture of an incredible Christian testimony in the face of overwhelming adversity, in the face of overwhelming opposition, in the face of true, absolute threat of life or death. What an incredible, incredible testimony. You know, and if you go to Matthew chapter 10, go to Matthew chapter 10, the Lord uh, outlines this truth for us as something that we need to be aware of. You know, we often say this, if you have a right fear of God, then you have no other fears, right? We fear God above all else, then we can have no other fears. And Matthew chapter 10 and verse uh, 28, look what the Lord Jesus said. These are the words of Christ, Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body. This is what we find right now with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, it's true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. We're not to have a fear of those who have physical power over us. We're not to have a fear of those that can kill the body. Why is that? You can only be killed once, right? Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, we are body, soul, and spirit. This body will die and go to the grave, and God willing, when the Lord determines and the Lord comes back, I'll get a glorified body to go with my uh, spirit and never dying soul. But, you know, I could be fearful. I could put more emphasis on the flesh than the soul. I can put more emphasis on the earthly rather than the eternal. We all can, can't we? But this is a great example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego giving us this picture. They, they are not fearing him that has the power to kill the body. They're fearing God. They are God-fearing young men. They are God-faithful young men. And they know it's a lot more important about just deciding whether to compromise to get power, position, and possessions in this world, yet deny the truth of God's word to make little compromises that are not little in God's eyes. Firstly, we see under the answer the confidence. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. 
There's no hint of cowardice. There's no hint of compromise. But this is a very calm, collected, courageous, and considered response. This isn't crazy, bawling, shouting, anger, fear. This is just calm, collected, courageous. They're resolute, but they're respectful. They're respectful to the king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Not careful, not full of care. We're not unduly concerned. We don't really feel there's any, any need for us to be worried enough to try and defend ourselves. We are not full of care about this matter. Yes, you're the king. Yes, we're going to die. Or it seems like we're going to die. But we're not full of care. We're not full of disrespect. We're not standing here appealing before the court, weeping, wailing, and moaning, complaining, whinging, and whining. It's not fair. It's not fair. Why you treat me so bad just because I'm a Bible-believing Christian? You shouldn't treat... I've got rights, you know. I can go to the court of uh, European Court of Human Rights. And they just said, we're just not full of care about this matter. You know, that's the same as Philippians 4, 6, isn't it? Be careful for nothing. Don't be full of care for anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, well, that king, you know, is breaking the law. I'm going to take him to court. I'm going to sue. I'm going to... Yeah, you can, but you know what will be shattered? Your peace. Remember Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Can't remember the verse. No, just turn there, actually. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul outlined the position of the Christian. He was really concerned about Christians taking other Christians to court. That's how the chapter started, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? You take things outside of the church. And, you know, it talks about saints judging the world and angels and so on and so forth. But uh, just look at the summation in verse number 7, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you. Paul is condemning the, Corinth, the believers at the Corinthian church because you go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Do you know it's a really important part of the Christian life that we sling out the window at it's not fair attitude. God says he doesn't care if it's fair or not. The Christian is a witness in all circumstances. The the Christian is a witness through all trials and difficulties, tribulation, work of patience, etc., etc., and so forth. And we should suffer ourselves to be defrauded. We should be willing to take the wrong, even if it costs us, the Bible said. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not appealing to the law. They're not petitioning. They're not uh, getting their attorneys. They're not getting their lawyers in. They're not getting their advocates in. It's just a confidence in God. You see, they have the confidence. Verse 17, they give the correction to Nebuchadnezzar. (laughs) They're concerned for him. If it be so, if the situation is how it should be, our God whom we serve, what are they saying? Yeah, you're right. We don't serve your gods, Nebuchadnezzar. You're right. We serve our God, the true God. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Okay, note the comma there. Our God is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. You see, there's two different things. They didn't say, our God will deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Our God is able to, if he wants to, deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. But either way, he will deliver us out of your hand. Nebuchadnezzar. You see, this is the correction that they're giving to him. They're saying to him, it's not in your hands, Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you have come to a misconclusion. You've got power. 
You've got everything. People do everything you say. But Nebuchadnezzar, if only you could read Romans chapter 13, Nebuchadnezzar. It's not written yet, but if you could read it, then you have to understand that you, as a king and a governor, are still nothing more than an instrument in the hands of the sovereign, omnipotent God. You're a puppet. We're his children. You're his puppet. They correct him. You've got power. You can make the law. You can stand against us. You can throw us into the fire. But what you cannot do, Nebuchadnezzar, is you cannot determine what God will or won't do. That is beyond even you. And that's wonderful, isn't it? And that's powerful. That's great faith. I'm putting our trust in God. God's going to stand for us. And, and, and is that true? But is that what causes us the problems in life? The problems in life are the commitment of verse 18, the but if nots of life, isn't it? They're standing there about to go in the fire. Our God we serve. He's able to deliver us. He's more than capable of doing that. But here's what causes us the problems in life. But if not. If it doesn't go the way we would like it to go. If it doesn't go the way that would really suit us the best, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, if God doesn't take you out with a lightning bolt, you know, bring Noah's flood again to quench your fire. If God determines in his will and counsel, if God determines that it is the fire for us, and that is how we will best witness for him, that is how we will best be faithful to him, if God determines so, then we are fine with that. But if not, what a fantastic start to a verse in the Bible. We need to understand it's always the but if nots that create our problem. We've got to understand the but if nots. That, that's the but if, but if it doesn't go my way, meaning the way I would like it to go, I will still stand faithful. I will still stand faithful. Firm, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, you need to know this, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We will not compromise. We will not bow. We will not bend. You see, they knew that God could work to meet their desire. Now, you may say, you're reading into the text there, Pastor. It doesn't say anywhere that they desired not to go into the flames. Oh, really? <laughs> I think we could read that into the text, right? They were human. You understand that. They weren't going, oh, please, throw us in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what we would really like. I don't think so. So I don't think he's reading into the text that their desire would not would be to not be thrown in the fire. But that's why they said he's able. But if not, they knew God could work to meet their desire, but they didn't know if he would work. But though God slay me, yea, will I trust him. Right, Job 13, 15. Christianity, it's not a game, friends. It's not, it's not a hobby. It's not a social circle. It's not a knitting and nattering club. And all the rest of it, it is about our true faith with our true God in a true Bible-believing church. And sometimes life gets really hard. And guess what? It is going to get worse and worse. Things will wax worse and worse. Evil men and seducers, right, will wax worse and worse. Perilous times shall come. We'd like it not to be that way. I'd like it to go smoothly. But if not, what will you do? See, what God does for one, he doesn't always do for another, right? Remember in the early church? 
James was killed with the sword. God brings Peter out of prison. You see, you can't say, well, God did this for so-and-so, so he'll do that for me. You don't, you don't know that. Paul got away, Stephen got stoned. Right? So it's the but if nots. It's the but if nots that causes the problems. It's the but if nots where the rubber hits the road. It's the but if nots. If it does not go the way you would like it to go, will you burn rather than bow? Because that's the Bible way. Do you know why? Because our commitment is based upon truth, not upon signs. Do you know how many people at the difficult times in the Christian life are going, give me a vision, God? And God's saying, I've given you a verse. You see, they knew Exodus 20. They weren't standing there before the fire going, God, give me a miraculous vision so I know what to do. God had given them a verse. They knew it. They believed it. They stood upon it and they said, but if it doesn't go our way, we're still standing on the word of God. Throw us into the fire. It's a great question we should ask ourselves, isn't it? In this day and age, as we see these perilous times, things waxing worse and worse, will we burn rather than bow? Or will we bow rather than burn? And may I say, well, honestly, if you... Answer yourself honestly right now and do the spiritual inventory. You already know whether you're a compromiser or one with convictions. You already know. You already know in your day-to-day -day life if you're constantly, constantly compromising. The great thing is, it's not over till it's over. You can get some biblical convictions and you can stand strong. May the Lord help us to be such a testimony in this world as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were for the Lord. We'll pick that up again next week. Father, we do thank you, Lord. Thank you for a fine example of some fine, strong young men. But Father, that could easily have been three young women and we've got some great examples in the Bible. Esther, who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this year to put it all on the line in a but if not situation as well. So God, I don't know tonight whether it's for young men, young women, old men, old women or anything in between, but I know this. It's the but if nots that causes the most problems. When we just get a little bit concerned if we don't think it's going to go our way. Will we keep our convictions or will we just become compromises no, so we can still do something good lord help us i pray we are uh, i hope and pray a bible believing church with bible believing people and lord we struggle and we all fail and this old flesh it's a battle is none of us perfect lord absolutely not but our father i do pray you'd help us strengthen our faith help thou me with mine own belief because we are in and heading towards very difficult days. Help us to keep the faith. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.